Hey, welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, and this is the recap of trial day 16 in the Karen Reed case. So grab your red solo cup, pour yourself a stiff drink, and let's recap. This morning, Jennifer McCabe retook the stand for the third day to continue her cross-examination. The defense first brought up the 12 times in her grand jury testimony where she described the defendant's statements that that Friday night going into Saturday morning when John O'Keefe was found. But during that grand jury testimony, the witness had failed to mention the defendant's alleged admission that she said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. She was asked about the morning of the 29th when she called Sergeant Lank back to 34 Fairview for a second conversation because she had additional information for him. Sergeant Lank had written an incident report detailing that second trip to the house and the information the witness provided to him. In the report, he wrote that the witness told him that the defendant said, quote, I hope I didn't hit him. Close quote. Jen insisted that she remember she told Sergeant Lank that the defendant said, I hit him, I hit him. So here we see yet another inconsistency between what a witness says they said versus what was documented in an official report. Another instance of that occurred when she was asked by Trooper Tully, who is a Massachusetts State Police, in September 2023, presumably when they were investigating Trooper Proctor. Trooper Tully asked her if she had known Proctor before then. She said that she never told Tully that she had never met Proctor. Now, we didn't see Tully's report, but based on the questioning, it appears that he wrote in that report that Jen McCabe told him that she had never known Proctor prior to the interview. She said, if that was written in, in his report, it's a lie. The defense next asked the witness about her time at home after leaving the party at 34 Fairview that Friday night. Her cell bright data logged her Apple Watch that saw that she climbed her stairs and logged into Safari. She confirmed that she went upstairs, got in bed, and started a uh, phone. She searched a basketball team that her daughter was invited to join. She was asked, so if you wanted to know how long it took a person to die from extreme temperatures, what would you type into Google? Now, she argued back and forth with the defense counsel saying, she doesn't know, she doesn't remember how she would enter the phrase into Google. And she, she did something when Karen asked her to search for that information later on. But at that point in time, early in the morning, in the two o'clock hour, she doesn't know. So defense counsel told her that she searched, quote, Haas, Haas long to die in cold, close quote. She asked for her memory to be refreshed. And after it was, her Google search prompt was published for us to see. The witness claimed that the searches, albeit misspelled, were made at 623 and 624 a.m. at Karen's request. The defense then asked why she made a search for the same information at 227 a.m., which would have been just after she got home after leaving the party. We saw the time there on the search report. The defense argued that Jen McCabe initially searched the phrase at 2.27 a.m. because she knew some incriminating information about John. And then she later searched the same thing to try and cover up the earlier search. Now, the witness was adamant that she never searched the phrase at 2.27 a.m. And that Selbright will have to explain why it's there. Defense next showed us that the report also indicated that that 227 search, it was deleted and they paused, they posed that the witness deleted the search because she knew it would incriminate her if it got out that she had made the search so early in the morning. So basically, Jen McCabe admitted to the correctness and accuracy of the 623 and 624 a.m. searches, but disputes 
there having been a 2.27 a.m. search, which also happens to be deleted. On that note, the defense finished its cross-examination. On redirect, the Commonwealth first asked Jen McCabe about the Life360 app. She testified that the app was pretty accurate in her experience, except sometimes in bad weather. But most of the time, she's had a good experience with it being accurate with uh, the location of her loved ones. The Commonwealth asked Jen about her about those late night searches on her phone. She said that she left her tabs, her, her internet tabs open on her phone, those tabs that she used for the basketball searches, she left those tabs open all night when she went to bed. Next morning, she testified that she just used one of those open tabs on her phone to make the Google searches about hypothermia. She was asked about types of Celebrate extraction and databases and wall files and knowledge profile C databases how information is stored and kept in a cell phone. She testifies she doesn't know anything about any of those technologies, and neither do I. Can we cue up the Celebrate expert, please? I'm going to need to hear from somebody who knows what they're talking about and who can accurately and competently describe the searches that were found on her phone and that 2.27 a.m. search whether or not there's any possibility that Jen McCabe is telling the truth about not having made that search at 2.27 a.m. Is that even possible? I don't know. Bring on the experts, please. She testified that at 4.53, she got the call that woke her up from John's niece, and she eventually spoke to Karen, who told her that she had left John at Waterfall. She said that Karen's story changed multiple times that morning, that she was telling people that John was dead and that a snowplow would hit him. So she was asked about various statements that Karen made that morning. After the Commonwealth refreshed her recollection, Jen McCabe said that in pr a prior proceeding, she had said that Karen said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, and that an EMT overheard. She said, in that prior proceeding, she was asked specifically about the different variations of the statements that Karen made. So apparently, I guess she's saying if she's not asked a specific question, she's not going to offer the information, which is absolutely ludicrous. Witness was asked about the conversation that she overheard between Carrie and the state troopers that occurred after the 29th, I think it was. Remember, she said that Carrie had come over to her house. They were working on a timeline and Carrie started speaking with the troopers. She had said yesterday in her testimony that she couldn't hear what Carrie was saying, but then she also could hear some things that she was saying. And you'll recall that's when she was reporting back to the group chat that she had with her husband and the Alberts, Brian and Nicole Albert. And she was telling them, oh my goodness, Carrie is telling them everything. So she was asked about what was she overhearing Carrie say that was so shocking. She said she heard Carrie say something to the effect of, quote, John really loved Amy who was an ex-girlfriend of his. And in her opinion, Karen was a babysitter with benefits, close quote. I'll leave that right there. On recross, the fence detailed the January 29th statement from Sergeant Lank, another statement that same day to Proctor, another statement the following Tuesday to Trooper Prince and grand jury testimony in April of 20. Uh, 2022, during which she said no fewer than 12 times um, what the defendant said. In not one of those statements did the witness tell any of the authorities or the jurors that Karen said she hit John. Defense counsel asked her about the source of the public outrage about the case and pinpointed that it only erupted in April this public outrage only erupted in April after Jen McCabe's Google searches were released. 
leaked, possibly. I don't know. But the public got wind of those searches and the fact that there was a 227 search when she couldn't possibly have, which was extremely suspicious. It was two months later that the witness, for the first time ever, testified that Karen said that she hit him. So we finished the direct cross-examination, redirect, and recross of Jennifer McCabe. So we heard a very stark timeline of when Jen McCabe first testified that Karen said she hit John. Between January 29th, when John passed away, and April, the witness never in any documented form attributed the I hit him, I hit him, I hit him statement to the defendant. Then in April, her Google searches were released, resulting in that public outrage and the ensuing harassment that she detailed to the jury. And it was only after that, in her July grand jury testimony, did she first testify that Karen said, quote, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. That fact in and of itself and the timing of when it's first documented that she testified to that is extremely, incredibly damning. And to Jen McCabe's veracity. The next witness was Carrie Roberts. That Friday night, she went bowling with her daughter. And as she got home, her husband, Kurt Roberts, who testified several weeks ago, I think at this point, He was on his way out of the house going to meet John O'Keefe and Michael Camerano. She was longtime friends with John from high school, and she had met Karen when he introduced them during the summer of 2020. She said that Kurt got home around 1030 and they went to bed. At 5 a.m., she said Karen called her, which was out of the norm. And it was actually the second time that Karen called her, but she missed the first call. She said she answered the phone and Karen was screaming, John's dead, Carrie, Carrie, Carrie. And the phone hung up. They didn't talk that first call, but Karen called her back. And the witness, she got out of bed and started getting dressed. Karen called her back about five minutes later. She told her, John didn't come home last night. I'm afraid he might be dead. He might've gotten hit by a plow. I wasn't supposed to stay in Canton last night. He'd never leave Kaylee alone. I think something's happened. She said Karen checked Kaylee's phone to see if John had called and he hadn't. So Karen said she was on her way to the witness's house to ask the witness if she could drive Karen's car uh, so they could look for John. Karen said that she didn't remember anything because they drank so much the night before. The witness told her to go home, be with Kaylee if Kaylee was by herself. She described Karen as frantic from that initial call through the rest of the time that she was with Karen that morning. So the witness agreed to drive Karen's car. She said she went downstairs, got in her car, waited about 10 minutes for Karen to show up. While she was waiting, she called the non-emergency phone line and the hospital to see if anyone had been brought in from a snowplow accident, but she didn't get news about that happening. She said she also called John before she got into her car, but she didn't reach him. Karen called her back and told her that she was at Jen McCabe's house and Jen was going to drive her. Now, the witness had only met Jen once before when they all went shopping and to lunch with John. She said they were not friends, but she had been to the McCabe house before because she had dropped Kaylee off there in the past. So the witness, who was waiting for Karen at her house, uh, then Karen called and said, no, I'm at Jen's house instead. The witness said, okay, I'll drive over to Jen's house. So while she was driving, she was on the phone with Karen on Bluetooth so she could hear Karen and Jen speaking. She said she heard them discussing where John might be and heard Karen mention her taillight. And when she got to the McCabe house, while parked behind uh, Karen's SUV and driveway, the witness saw the taillight and said that a piece was missing and snow was caked onto it. So they decided to go to John's house to thoroughly look through the house. 
Jen drove Karen in Karen's car and the witness followed behind them in her car. Now, much of Carrie's testimony is the same as what we heard from Jen McCabe regarding getting to John's house, looking through the house for him. The Commonwealth played the same security footage showing the two cars pulling up and the women getting out and going inside the garage. The witness explained that Karen pointed out her taillight to them, but after seeing the footage, she said that it might, it must have been when they were leaving John's house that Karen pointed the taillight out. She said that there was a piece of metal sticking sticking out for where a piece of taillight that was missing. So my question again is, where is that footage? Why can't why can't we be shown that footage if they have the ring footage from John's house of the ladies getting to the house? Why don't they have it showing the ladies leaving the house? I don't know. After searching the house and not finding him, Carrie said she wanted to go out and look to see if he'd been hit by a plow somewhere, but that Jed and Karen, they both wanted to go to 34 Fairview. When they were driving to John's house, Jen had said she saw Karen outside 34 Fairview the night before. So because of Jen, because of Jen saying that, Karen wanted to go to 34 Fairview. So after leaving John's house, they headed to Fairview. They traveled on main streets looking to see if John was walking home or if he was hit on the side of the road. Jen was giving Carrie directions because Carrie had never been there before. And the witness said that Karen was in the back seat, frantic the whole time uh, while they were driving. And at one point they started talking about Bella's mom, whose name I think is Amy. She's a dance instructor who John had once dated. Karen said that Bella's mom never liked her, but she wondered if John might be over there. While driving, uh, the witness was looking on both sides out the window, searching for John. On Fairview, Jen pointed out her sister's house and Karen all of a sudden screamed, there he is, there he is, let me out. Carrie looked at Jen and said she's crazy, referring to Karen, but she unlocked the doors, letting Karen out of the back seat. We've heard this testimony before that Karen ran directly over to a mound that was body shaped. She lifted up her shirt and started laying on top of John. Now the police dash cam played, showing the scene while Carrie quietly cried on the stand. This was the first real emotion that we've seen either for the situation that she was reliving or for her friend, John, that we've seen in weeks. She said once she realized it was a person underneath that snow, she ran over and dug the person's head out of the snow, realized it was John. He was on his back. She brushed snow off his face and she saw blood coming out of his nose and mouth and his right eye looked like a golf ball. She said he was bleeding around the back of his head. She noticed it while she was putting a blanket around his head and saw blood on the blanket. She said it was, he was covered with a few inches of snow. Karen was laying on top of him. She told her to get off so that she could start CPR. And she told Jen to call 911. She said Karen was saying, did I hit him? Is he dead? Multiple times. Carrie said she started doing chest compressions and Karen was doing mouth to mouth. First responders started arriving and took over rescue efforts shortly after. As paramedics worked on John, she went back to, you know, where her car was. And she said Karen was frantic and just running around, you know, back and forth to where John was, back to the car. She said when the EMTs picked John up, she could see grass underneath him. And his cell phone was underneath him as well. She picked up his phone and put it in her pocket. Um, a first responder, she doesn't re remember who, asked her for the cell phone and she handed it over to them. After that, the three women went into the car where they prayed and Karen saw the blood on her hands thinking it was menstrual blood. Carrie said after the ambulance left, she said um, Karen was in Carrie's car. Carrie called the O'Keefe's, John's parents, and Karen had called John's family to let them know what was going on. And Jen went into the house to wake her sister up. Mary said that she was about to leave when she saw Matt McCabe coming up. She told him that she was going to go get the, the O'Keefe's and he offered to go with her, but she declined. She and the defendant got into her car. 
At one point, Karen told her that if John died, she was going to kill herself, and she asked the witness to take care of the kids. When they were a couple of minutes away, Officer Good called her and asked her to come back to the scene to bring Karen back because Karen's parents had called in a suicide section for Karen. And during the time on that way back to Fairview, the defendant spoke to her mom and the witness took the phone to speak with Karen's mom. The mom told Carrie to make sure that Karen did not have her purse because she had medication in there and the mom didn't want Karen to take the medication. They got back to the scene. Karen got out of the car and went straight to the ambulance. After dropping Karen off at the scene, Carrie left once again to get John's parents. During that drive, the witness said Karen called her several times asking if Carrie would come to the hospital. In another call, when John's parents were at the car with Carrie, she said Karen called her again and told her that she'd drop John off at a party, but she didn't go into the party with him. When she got to the hospital with uh, John's parents, John's brother was already there. John's cousin, who worked at the hospital, came out to greet the family and take the witness to the bathroom to wash John's blood off her hands. Harry went to the chapel to pray and then checked in with John's cousin to see what his status was. His family was called in by the doctor who told them that John was gone and the witness was given the opportunity to see John's body. She said he looked worse. He was in a neck brace and now both eyes were huge and black, not just the one she had seen earlier. She also saw scratches on his right arm. She said after that, she drove to, uh, she drove John's dad to John's house on Meadows Drive. And she thinks Karen's SUV was still there. Later that day, two officers from the state police went to Carrie's house to speak with her. Proctor wasn't there, wasn't one of them. They also spoke with her husband. She said she spoke to Proctor once while she was at Jen McCabe's house. She says she never gave any interview to any Canton officer. The Commonwealth finished its direct examination at that point, and surprisingly, defense said they had no questions for the witness. At this point, Laura Sullivan took the stand. She described how she, her, and her boyfriend uh, vacation in every year. With the end of COVID restrictions, she and her boyfriend invited additional people on their trip. So her trip ballooned actually from five people to about 60 people who joined them on that trip to Aruba. Sounds like a lot of fun to me. She received a message from John O'Keefe asking for more information about the trip, expressing, you know, interest. She had met John in 2013 through her boyfriend, Pat, who was also a Boston police officer and best friends with John O'Keefe. She got pregnant in 2013 with Pat's baby, but Pat passed away in 2013, that same year. Since then, John was a constant support system for her. And she asked John to be her, her child's godfather. So he was known to her and the child and the rest of her family as the godfather. So when he expressed interest about going on this trip to Aruba, she was overjoyed. She said, that he said he, it would be him, the kids, and Karen Reed, who she hadn't yet met. But she spoke with Karen on the phone before the trip and shared details of the whole hotel and its accommodations and everything with Karen. So time for the trip came and everybody got down there. They met. They seemed like, you know, they were on very well. We then got into a story of an incident that happened while on that Aruba vacation trip that was the source of some controversy, apparently. So through this witness, Laura Sullivan, and the next witness who took the stand, Marietta Sullivan, who is Laura Sullivan's little sister, who was also on the trip, we learned that there was an incident where John was drunk and Marietta found him stumbling and embraced him 
And apparently they were seen in that embrace by Karen Reed, who did not know at the time who Marietta was. Karen Reed instantly got heated at the situation and accused John of stepping out on her with this woman that Karen had never met before. John tried calming Karen down, but she was slightly irate at the point in time. They exchanged words and a rift was formed between the two women that apparently exists until today because there was some serious side eye being thrown from the witness stand towards the defense table. Anyways, story ended with us learning that by the end of the trip, Karen apologized for her mistaken assumption that there was some indecent activity going on between John and Marietta. And she offered to pay for Marietta's hotel room. So both testimonies paired together sort of painted a picture of Karen's alleged volatility and her behavior and flying off the handle before getting all the information of a situation and sets the stage for the Commonwealth to make the allegation that Karen Reed is hot-headed and may have also been the night of the incident leading to take some tragic action. So at the end of day 16, we finished the testimony of Carrie Roberts, and more importantly, the defense had no cross-examination for her. She was a good witness. She was not combative. She had no agenda. She was not hostile. She simply said what happened to her, what she saw, and what she heard. And what she heard did not include Karen Reed saying that she hit John O'Keefe. She and John were genuine friends, and she expressed true feelings about that loss, something that we've not seen since perhaps the first two witnesses, John's brother and sister-in-law. We also heard about the infamous Aruba event through the testimony of the Sullivan sisters. They had a strong family connection to John. He was the godfather of his best friend's son. We heard how John stepped up in their time of need to ensure that they had the support that they needed. We really got a feel for who John was as a person when it came to how he treated the people that he loved. So on the Aruba trip, we learned that Karen accused John of making out with the younger Sullivan sister. They had a short but heated exchange and John apparently was a bit sullen after that. But we also heard that Karen apologized about the situation and the mistake and that she offered to make amends. So that's how it was left today. We still have more questions. Lots of questions about Cellbrite records. Um, I think that's probably the biggest question for me that came out of today's testimony. So I'm waiting for experts to, uh, to take the stand. We have no court tomorrow, which would be Thursday, May 23rd. But we'll be back on Friday for the testimony of who I think will be Brian Higgins, the owner of the infamous Jeep with the snowplow. I hope you join me then. Until the next drop, peace.